Hi and welcome to Ideology, the industrial design podcast. My name is Wojtek Hołysz and here I get to pick the brains of product design experts. Have you ever thought about replacing prototyping with simulations? Have you ever tried running product simulations yourself? Are they cheaper than prototyping? Do they even do the same job? To make sense of this crossroad, I sat down with two product design experts, Piotr Dalewski and Mikołaj Wiewiura from Mind Sailors. Let's dive in. I remember we've had a uh, quite prolonged discussion about the process of designing and the dynamics of of uh, the process of designing, basically. That's a different podcast episode. But during that conversation, we also talked about prototyping and simulations, which are responsible for quite a lot of the dynamics during designing, but it's an interesting interesting topic itself. So let's just talk about it. So starting from the basics, uh, let's go with prototyping maybe. What is a prototyping, uh, a prototyping, what is a prototype and what is prototyping about? Well, before we start, I would like to say that we need to be aware that many the introductions of new products are great investments for our customers and the main cost of these investments are manufacturing and tooling costs. In order to avoid excessive introduction costs, we need to develop, I would say, flawless products. But as I noticed from my experience, uh, the work of design engineer is full of questions, sometimes hesitations, and to, to make our, so our work easier, we prepare prototypes to test our design assumptions. So I guess that's, from my perspective, I'm not a designer myself, that sort of sounds something like more or less might be considered a simulation as well, but it's not. Uh, so when do we prototype and when do we use simulations? Um, I would say you should always do some kind of prototyping or simulations. Um, it depends on the situation. It depends on the, it depends on the uh, project that you are working on. Mm -hmm. But um, the rule of thumb should be that with each iteration or with um, each question that you have, um, just before attempting to product uh, to, to to manufacture something, let's prototype it first. Um, you will be able to answer a lot of questions that already are stated, but sometimes you will have more questions that will be answered um, during the prototyping testing. Like you have the prototype and you can test it and you will have more information that you wanted to gain. That's actually sort of a question I wanted to ask. So uh, I, I assume from the perspective of a client who ordered a design, a prototype might be something different than it is for you as a designer. So sure. what, what is a prototype for you in your process? Um, a prototype for designer is a physical evidence of uh, being right or wrong in some kind of uh, understanding. My wife is the physical evidence that I'm wrong, always. <laughs> <laughs> I believe there is uh, not a one particular definition of, this, of a prototype, but I would like to think that this is a physical object, the device or part of the device mm -hmm. that allows us to validate some design assumptions or even give us more data about something, about the issues we didn't consider the first time. So while assembling the prototype, we can rethink the assembly process. For example. Certainly, certainly, of course. I think that uh, prototyping serves um, for, for clients it is usually a visual prototype. Like, how does this thing look physically? Uh, because 
on a screen in the presentation when we uh, show beautiful renderings to the client, uh, there is one thing missing in that slides. It's scale factor. Um, we usually tend to um, miss uh, the scale that we see on the screen versus the scale of the physical prototype. You mean like that. even when a, a visual has some scale to it, like I know there's a mug next to a product or a car next to a product, it's still not the same as witnessing it in real m physical yes. life. Yes. Um, having a, a visual in context, of course, helps, but still it's not yeah. the same as, as physical prototype. Mm, so this is the main function of, of a prototype for, for clients, usually. Mm, but when we are speaking about so-called functional prototypes, we want them to serve us as a source of crucial information right before we are attempting to DFM or any other uh, process that um, leads this uh, project to manufacturing. Because we, n we want to know not only about the physical properties uh, of, of materials, of how mm, the assembly goes, if it goes well or wrong, but also how does it feel, for example, to push a button on, on this prototype. Because if you have some tactile buttons on, mm. on it, you have to feel um, with your yeah. with or, your fingers. Or here. Or here. How yeah. does it click? There are um, even designers for acoustics for cars. How does how do the doors shut? Yeah. So this is important um, to prototype the whole product and its uh, and its uh, certain um, features so that you will have the answer before attempting to manufacturing something. That's, I believe, one of the most important things in prototyping for designers. Well, you, you, that's something actually you... Because I've mentioned before I'm not a designer, so I've always imagined it like that. It's sort of like uh, professional science in a way. First, you have a theory, you theorize about it, you write it down, you do the calculations, but still you have to test it to see if your theory is right. That's what I, that's like prototyping for me. You test whether your previous assumptions are provable. Uh, on the pure basics, it's like a proof of concept, but the further you go in the process, the more concrete those tests sort of uh, uh, become. But we also need to distingu distinguish them from simulations. So when are prototypes the way to go and where and when not? Uh, sometimes the designer must face, face some limits um, when it comes to technology of um, prototype manufacturing. And in the design process, we are not able to mirror the properties of a finished product um, with the prototype product. But it is crucial to find the most suitable solution, the golden point between them to have as exact prototype to test those conditions, conditions of use or environmental issues. Uh, so when the project is too big or the investment to create the prototype is too large, we are using simulations to solve our doubts. Mm -hmm. Can you give me some examples of uh, what sort of product would make sense to a prototype and which what sort of product would make more sense to run simulations? We're using simula simulations when we are looking for some, some kind of feature, some kind of physical value, like, for example, the stress bending moments or, or heat transfer or magnetic flux. Mm -hmm. So these are the calculations that allows us to find some features, some values that we're going to use in our design or that we need to include. Okay. 
So uh, if I understand correctly, such simulations often go in pair with prototyping. They're not exclusive that you either run simulations or prototype. Our projects are quite diverse. So in some cases, we some only prototype. Some In some cases, we only do simulations, but often we use both of them. For example, injection molded parts. Uh, these are many housings of our products. And at the first stage, we are doing the prototype just to assess, for example, ergonomics, if it's, if it's comfortable to use some kind of item. But so this is the one case of using the prototype. The second more advanced prototype would test the mechanical features. So in that case, we're going to use precise 3D prints that mirror the properties of uh, injection molded material. So we're towards the product the product development. We're trying to get as similar prototype to the product we want to finally achieve. But when we are design those parts, we can do also some analysis, like stress analysis, if if these parts will be durable enough, or the other analysis, uh, injection molded, injection molding analysis. These analysis uh, help us to find a golden point between the design and the process. So we need to include the geometry of the part, the heat transfer, and the flow of the molten plastic. And when we're prototyping, there's like one big disadvantage that the prototype might be destroyed during tests. So we can bend the part and it will break. But for example, if we use the finite element analysis uh, and with the software calculation, we can do a number of simulations and each with div different variant. So for example, we can test the different thickness of the part and we can have some conclusions that allows us to choose the best choice for our purpose. Maybe maybe right before going deep into simulations, um, let's turn back to, to prototypes because I think that we forget about some examples on what materials can be used for, for prototyping. Because um, we've mentioned uh, injection molded parts and we've mentioned 3D prints, but uh, the world doesn't stop or the pr world of prototyping doesn't stop on 3D printing. Because uh, even 10 years ago... It doesn't even start there. It, yeah, <laughs> it doesn't even start there. Um, it can be a, um, a CAD model, so to say. It's cardboard aided design. Um, it can be a simple um, wooden piece that is carved with knife or any other hardware tools that you have in your workshop so that you will find the perfect balance between ergonomics and, uh, mm, and proportions, maybe. Um, you can even use some foams, like hard foams, um, to to even sculpture the part? To, to, yeah, to, to sculpt the part even easier than it was with, uh, uh, with wood. So um, there were a lot of iterations of products that required ergonomics or some basic functionalities made out of foam in our studio because it's the simplest way to achieve the goal. Uh, we didn't care about the mass. We didn't care about um, the overall style for now. But we did care about ergonomics. We did care about uh, packing the right uh, things inside, like batteries, like PCBs and anything else, so that we could um, establish the form around the things that are inside. So um, this helps a lot especially in handheld products. Yeah. But um, there might be even uh, different things. Um, for example, uh, my beloved uh, automotive industry um, is using uh, clay, mm, not because it's uh, 
cheap, not because it's robust, because it has a lot of processing to do before you get the result. But this is still one of the fastest fastest way to have mm, a mutual understanding between designer and uh, surface designer of what is going to be achieved uh, during the design process. Because designers in automotive industry are a little bit different than us designers, industrial designers. They do care about the style a lot, um, but they have their teammates that care about ergonomics, they care about um, regulations. So there are a lot of different um, specializations in this area and people have to meet around this sculpted car. In our business, this is a little bit different. Of course, we need specialists in different areas, but still mm, um, style is just a piece of this uh, design process. You think it's so different? Because it sounds like it's exactly the same, but on a different scale. Like a, a, a car is basically a ton of products put together. Um, a car is a ton of different products, but it, uh, it, it sometimes details play a role in, in, this, um, in this area. Uh, I think that uh, some lines on a, on a car body uh, might resemble a surface finishing in uh, industrial design product. Mm -hmm. Like you've got a pattern on, on, on a grip, hand, on, on the handle uh, of the device. And you do care a lot about this pattern, um, but not right before establishing the form. This pattern is, is a detail. Um, such lines in car industry are sometimes details, but sometimes they uh, are important to mm, make this um, this body mm, rigid. Mm -hmm. So the play is crucial in in here. That's why um, automotive industry plays with clay a lot. They do some fine detailing and they turn front and back between three D model and clay model. In our um, profession, it's a little bit different. Once we turn our uh, foam or even clay models into 3D, we tend to stay in 3D. We tend to prototype um, things by means of 3D printing, by means of uh, CNC machining, because this is more precise for us and allows to test even more. Um, than clay models because we couldn't find how to assemble things with clay mm -hmm, mm -hmm. simply. So it's similar, but I believe it's a little bit different. Okay. Well, what I would like to add about the prototypes in our industry that these are, uh, they should be uh, physical objects. We are gaining the additional new knowledge to develop the product. I mean, the specialized prototypes we use in the end of mechanical development process. So, and these, these prototypes also have to be manufactured. These are low volume productions. So the cost of each, each prototype device is significant, significantly higher than, than full volume production, but I consider it as an investment. So invest, we are paying for the knowledge to avoid some problems. So sure. I'd like to think about prototyping as an insurance against the unpredicted accidents. Okay. It's a good way of thinking in my opinion as well. And that's also a good segue to get into simulations more because the cost of prototyping is one of the reasons why simulations are used, right? Right, right. Sometimes uh, it is even more difficult to um, to prototype uh, things when the size grows. Sometimes you need to design, not in our profession, but you have to design a bridge and you have to be sure that this bridge will withstand the, the forces uh, yeah. 
that it is uh, going to, to to a stand during the lifetime. So that's why simulations and calculations are important. Um, we had some projects with simulations um, inside of the project because um, we thought that it will be easier to find the right um, proportions of the frame, for example, um, and uh, the um, particular cross sections of the beams inside the frame, so that once we turn that into turn our project into prototype, we are far more certain that this frame is going to be the right solution. So we could test different aspects of this prototype, not answering the questions if it withstands the, um, the force given. Um, this is one of the reasons for doing simulations. Uh, the second reason I came up with is that not only the size is problem, but also testing of a device in some cases might cause very problems. For example, we need testing devices like something, some tensor meters to measure the forces, the stress or deflections. Sure. So in some cases, it's easier to calculate it before we prototype it. Are simulations uh, the same as prototypes in the sense that, uh, I don't know, you guys know how to create prototypes of the, your designs, but can you, are you also the right people to run those types of simulations? Or is it a different sort of uh, expertise? Of course, it's a different field of expertise. Um, because uh, Piotr mentioned finite elements uh, method. It's one of the way to simulate things, a, a physical world. But finite elements uh, are uh, for measuring forces, um, for measuring um, stresses. So for, for particular part of simulations of, in the world. There are other, like um, light transferring in a light guide. There is another topic. Um, we could simulate how does the light guide um, transfer the, the light from, from its uh, source to the end point um, by using um, ray tracing, for example. So this is a kind of simulation that we can do because it requires us to master uh, software that uh, is used for renderings, for example, like Keyshot. So it's, it's pretty um, accurate. But if we are going to use a finite um, element method, uh, of course, we know some basics, but this is a completely new level of expertise, especially when you need to simulate an assembly. Because a simple beam is pretty easy. You've got no mm, welds, you've got no connection points like with uh, uh, bolts or anything else but if it comes to uh, to more complex form a system yeah mm, you should uh, definitely ask an expert uh, to to simulate to run the simulation yeah in, in simulations uh, um, there is a thing that what you put this is what you get so the the good uh, assumptions at the start will give you the right answers after finishing the simulation. If you uh, run the simulation with uh, bad assumptions or with bad um, prior conditions, you will have some answers because simulation always runs and it it's, um, plots some mm -hmm. uh, results, but these results may be unusable. That's why it's important to have an expert to uh, run this simulation and assess the results whether they are correct or not. I'd like to get back to the question of when should we use uh, physical prototypes and when should we simulate or when should we use them both? For this question, I have no exact one 
answer because everything depends on the pr uh, project. Sometimes we are able just to calculate, estimate, and we are pretty convinced that it will do. But for some products, we are not able to foresee the whole process. So we're adjusting ourselves. Sometimes it's easier to, to prototype. Sometimes we need some extra calculations to validate our work. So basically, during the product development, we are tailoring the process to achieve all the questions we need. What is important that we have to have some kind of strategy for that. So sometimes it's not efficient to buy the golden sample prototypes. They are pretty exact, but it's easier to start with some initial calculations, initial simulations, and then we based our designs on these simulations. So there's like, I'm gonna sorry, I'm sorry to bother you, but I don't have any exact answer for that. Okay. <laughs> No problem. <laughs> yeah, but uh, there is one thing that is common for prototyping as well as simulations. Um, this a common thing is uh, is an as notion of validation. We have to understand something new or learn something new from each iteration of simulation or prototype. Uh, without this simple idea, any prototype or any simulation is a waste of time and waste of money. Mm, that's why it, it's important to have, as you said, a strategy for prototyping. Um, the strategy usually evolves during the project. It's not possible to predict uh, how prototyping or simulation will look during the um, product development. But we will certainly come to ideas on which parts of the project should be prototyped or which parts might be simulated because it will be more efficient. Um, so the idea of evaluation uh, is to learn something new from, from each iteration of the prototype. Um, this gives us more information to develop better product. Um, once we know the answer for our questions and one, once we feel the, the prototype, we know when to uh, adjust our trajectory of, uh, of development because uh, it's uh, no, there is no easy way to, to answer your previous question. There is no easy way to say that we need, for example, three prototypes to, to achieve be the best product. Sometimes three prototypes are enough for, for a simple product, but there are times or products that need several hundreds of prototypes. Um, it rarely happens in, these, uh, in, in this world for now. But I'm pretty sure that big companies um, that have um, million or billions of dollars for uh, of budget for for developing new products uh, still do this path. Like, what is the best product or the best solution for the problem stated in our uh, company to serve our clients? Um, smaller companies, startups usually don't have this much time and this much money to, to spend a lot of time on um, small iterations. So we try to squeeze um, the iterations to be as little as possible, yet informative and uh, being purposeful. This is something very important in our design life. Um, so you've also mentioned about the golden sample. Um, I think that we could clarify a little bit about, about the golden sample because golden sample is something that resembles a product to its fullest. Like it has the same surface finishing, it has the same weight, it has the same, probably the same materials even, so that this serves you as a 
presentation of your product in a physical world so that you could place it on the table or put it in a room because sometimes it's too big to be placed on the table to say that this is a, the best um, what we could achieve to show you that this product will finally look like that. So it's like a master copy. <laughs> like a master copy, yes. Um, but this is the end result of a lot of different iterations and sometimes simulations right before you see this golden sample. Um, so we don't think that prototyping is just putting something beautiful on the table and simulations, but it's, uh, it's a process of doing something really ugly sometimes, but worth doing before we, because we know something more about it. Uh, that's uh, that's uh, my answer to this uh, overall problem on how to prototype or simulate, on when to do things uh, together. Okay, mm. you've, you've mentioned uh, uh, a few times uh, cost and time needed to simulate or prototype. So I imagine uh, it's... Uh, because what you guys are saying is that it, it makes perfect sense for both simulations and prototyping to be obligatory in each design process. But still, the more you talk about the cost of both those processes, sounds like it's probably not always the case because uh, every business uh, is looking for um, some sort of savings during the, uh, the design process. So... Uh, what would you say about the necessity of both those processes uh, in design projects? Uh, I consider both simulations and prototyping as uh, tools in the product development process. So these tools are actually the investment to develop the product. And the role of an expert is to choose which tools are the best for our for our work, for our project. Mm, so if we gonna, if we want to find spare some money in a short amount of time and not spend enough mm, for high quality tools, we cannot uh, expect the high quality results. So in short term, it might seem like a saving, but actually, we're losing our insurance, our investment, and that might cause very problems or delays or even or even stop the product project. Okay. Yeah, yes. W without prototyping, the risk of failing is uh, significantly bigger. Um, because you cannot assume in a physical world, especially, that's something that you've designed in a CAD system or in, a, in any other non-physical way, so to say, that the result will be perfect for the first time. It's, it rarely happens, especially when uh, each product is different. If we say that we are a manufacturers of glass cups or injection molded cups that when the wall, wall thickness is known for us, it will be probably a little bit easier to predict which design will uh, will go well or will which design will fail. But come on, we are not manufacturing caps all the time. So um, even if we are, there are prototyping or running a, pr a prototyping series, when you find out that the material that you used all the time is a bit different this time because you've ordered the material from different vendor and you've got uh, a different properties of this material and you have to adjust the uh, injection molding process a little bit. This requires prototyping um, or finding the best, the, finding perfect or optimal um, conditions for manufacturing this product within the given material, within given molds, tools, anything else. So um, 
that's that's another aspect i think of of uh, the notion of prototyping yes i think the one of the roles of the designer is to limit the risk of their designs we have to be sure and responsible for our designs for our products and if we keep that risk and pass it into the next phase, phase the manufacturing phase the cost of eliminating these those risks will grow exponentially i've got a metaphor maybe for for summarize to summarize this uh, this idea um, let's assume that you are a a beginner runner you'd like to um, to uh, you, to take a, um, the risk of running a marathon and finish the marathon in in four hours. How certain are you that you will finish this without even running short distance, without checking your performance, uh, your abilities and your tools that you have, like shoes, um, water um, holders that you that you can use. So how certain are you? You can assume that you will finish this marathon because 10 or 20 years ago, you were able to run five kilometers in um, in in a few minutes, yeah? Uh, or or uh, In a short period of time. In a short period of time. But time have, uh, has passed. Uh, you are a different person. Um, and you have to, so to say, prototype this process and how to run the marathon um, without running the marathon. Quite a few people do practice and are very sure that they will finish a marathon and they still don't. Um, so, so even when you you think you're prepared, you still need to calculate, like you said, the, the, the risks and there's always something yes. to test. Yes, that's, uh, that's why this metaphor is, I think, pretty decent because we minimize the risk. Always something wrong wrong can happen in the area that we didn't test or we didn't predict. But the more we prototype, the more we um, look for solutions and the more experience we have as as experts, as a company, um, the, 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 the risks uh, are also reduced to a, to a minimum level. But still, um, running... Design process is like running a marathon. You have to be prepared. You have to constantly check whether you are in a good on a good path or not, because you, you might turn the wrong, wrong uh, turn in the in the path, and you will run eventually, but uh, not to the finish point, mm -hmm. but to something uh, much different. <laughs> If you're interested in more discussions on industrial design, check out other episodes of Ideology, the Industrial Design Podcast. You can find us on YouTube, Spotify, and other podcast streaming platforms.